From TMP to TTNG For sure the cure and those tired meme jeans Hella can sell and the promise ring Sunny day real estate and rights this spring Prince Twinkle Daddy's help keep the dream alive I constantly thank God for Algernon and Remo Christie front drive Mineral snowing high tide hotelier and more DC emotive hardcore But you gotta admit Kyle and Ellie really on that emo bullshit You gotta admit That Kyle and Ellie really on that emo bullshit Have you heard The tired and disavowed lonely word Have you heard about and lonely word have you heard the lonely disavowed word have you heard the tired and lonely disavowed e-word episode 31 of the e-word this is our decade isn't it 32 episode 32 of the e-word this is your <laughs> uh 2012 recap a decade under the influence episode um it is not only the recap but it is also going to be about glockamora's just married which was voted in as your record from 2012 this is kyle that's ellie hi um can i real quick just say that i was so relieved when glockamora won like i know that they are like maybe the darlings of our emo from this era but also i i feel like the the runner-up modern baseball has like enough fans that they could have tipped it you know it doesn't really have like underdog behind it but it's just like so goddamn beloved it's like a cult classic in the definition of the word i feel like uh snowing and the snowing record and the Algernon record have kind of gone down uh, in some sort of like critical history, you know, mm-hmm. like they they are kind of renowned even among people who aren't super into this whole quote unquote emo revival thing. But Glockamora is a band for people who are into this shit and they seem to like fit right into like some puzzle piece within our hearts, you know. Yeah, like, I don't know anyone who doesn't like this record. I think this is Glock, or I think this is uh, Blade Brown's favorite emo record of all time. Oh, okay. Um, and, yeah, uh, and I know a lot of people who are who are just like that. I don't like th- This is like a universal record, I think, for people who are into this. Yeah, and like it's been covered, sure, but it's also just like everybody knows the story of modern baseball, like. Mm-hmm. That's been covered all on all bases. Yeah, it would have been nice to to get Zach on. Uh, we very, very nearly did. Yeah. It was very close, but at the end of the day, he just kind of felt embarrassed of this album, and so he didn't want to want to get on that. Yeah, which I understand. I understand, and it also put us in a situation where it's like, well the person that wrote the lyrics and i think the songs doesn't want to be onto it we're not going to turn to the to someone else to be like hey do you want to talk about this record i feel like that's just dick move 100 percent. and because of that i feel like deep diving on this record would also be a little bit disrespectful if we had never reached out to zach then i would feel kind of better about like transposing my own feelings about the songs onto them but you know, given that we had the opportunity to talk to, to talk to Zach about this stuff, then I kind of feel like, uh, like they're like, like it's, uh, overstepping. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah. So we're, yeah, we're obviously going to talk about it and like, it's obviously not going to be like, what do you think of these lyrics or about this line stuff like that? Just because yeah, the man said 
he wasn't in too long. Yeah, and I mean, with when you have songs like Anniversary Song, like I definitely don't think that it's uh, it's like shocking that he didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, because I... that song's pretty fucking personal. But as we mentioned, Blackmore just married is at the top of the list. I guess we can start with 2012. Like, where where were you, and do you have any observations about music coming out in 2012? 2012, I feel was like a, a bit of a weird transitional year. I think that it we were were like in the middle of emo being an underground thing and emo becoming like a hot button topic because. As I've said a couple times now in this series, the next year is when everything kind of boils over. Mm-hmm. Not not just in emo, but in all the adjacent scenes as well. And so this kind of just feels like a, like a bit of a muddled year when you look at all these releases uh, put together. You got some bands that are still doing the DIY twinkle thing. You got some bands who are doing the post-hardcore thing. You got some bands who are like kind of almost in the middle. I feel like everyone everywhere is like kind of in that in between space with this record that they did this year. I don't know. It just feels like messy, like a not not a cohesive year for music. That's that's really how I felt too. Because I feel like this is the year that like everyone was trying was not 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 trying to like it wasn't like an active thing this year, but it was two years at like its yeah. messiest where people were just trying to call something emo that wasn't and i think this year we started to see that Mm -hmm. um do you know when the emo copy pasta started which one real emo only consists of 2016 oh i think something that's also worth noting is that with this year we have records from dousing and modern baseball that kind of are laying the groundwork for something less twinkly and more emo pop or straight up pop punk to be yeah. part of the scene without being considered, you know, like uh crew necks, pizza, khaki shorts, pop punk, you know, Midwest emo. We kind of saw become, I mean, later we kind of saw become like twinkle and, you know, like the cutesy get up kids stuff. Yeah. And I think that started to like split, I don't know, because we were getting like this like mathy shit like the past two years. I feel like we saw it split more and more starting in 2012. I think 2011 and 2013 are both much more solid, solid years for emo in that they seemed kind of like focused around uh, either a particular sound or a particular scene, you know, like 2011 is definitely like the year post hardcore broke. 2013 would be like oh shit, people are making Twinkle music still, but they're also starting to kind of make money off of it. (laughs) Right. This was also kind of a year of a lot of like heavier stuff that, yeah, I guess like you saw kids being into like modern baseball, but still fucking with these Converge records or these Code Orange Kids records. Yeah. Why are you calling me out? (laughs) Because they're on this list right next to each other, and they're both heavy and and, and also popular. Um, I think like shortly after this, you know, you started to see less of it. You you like started to see people that like wouldn't go to Warp Tour because the lineup was too much of one and not not much of the other thing that they liked. Yeah, I think we still have like a little bit of time before the scene starts to fragment again. 2012 is definitely like peak everything all jammed together in like one scene you know it's Mm -hmm. like like you said the modern baseball kid is also the code orange kids guy you know like i feel like i'm just repeating you at this point (laughs) (laughs) um you're making you're making good observations is what i'm saying (laughs) thank you uh do you think there's i mean do you think there's a publication that's covering uh, all of it? I mean, Alternative uh, Press I think... wasn't on the tip. That's the thing. Yeah, I think maybe Punk News got the closest to covering as much of the stuff as as feasible. But they weren't really covering the sceney stuff, were they? What do you mean by the sceney stuff? I would say something like The Chariot. 
Because that will, because that like straddled. I mean, every time I die, they were definitely covering that. But everyone fucks with every time I die. That's true. I fuck so, with every time I die I'm so hard. <laughs> okay, being as an ocean, now that's a scene band, right? Uh, sure. I think this is also the year where, like, quote unquote, scene bands, uh, kind of had like true credibility. You know. Like, I don't know, like a band like La Dispute uh, in 2012 could be considered either like a scene band or like a quote unquote true band. You know, like right. people from both sides were into it. Like I knew people from like the true DIY down in the gutter Vegas hardcore scene who went to being as an ocean shows. OK, 100 percent. The real like sceny weeny teeny bopper stuff like pierce the veil is like a different animal right yeah that that's like off the deep end with that stuff yeah a lot of that stuff i still like like dance gavin dance but you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) this podcast isn't about that yet (laughs) i guess continuing what what we were talking about last time with like certain labels basically label like no sleep kind of an off year 2012 yeah yeah, like I said, there's no real scene or label or band that everyone is kind of like pulling towards. You know, there's no real epicenter of the scene. It's just kind of a mess. Yeah, it really is. It, this is this is really a messy year. Just looking at it, because it's like we have some like good first records on this list, and we have just some that we got a, a me without you record when like probably me without you were like questioning making a next record. <laughs> Um, yeah (laughs) (laughs) but we'll get to that and you know glockamore just married came out on kind of like records kind of like records was like oh i gotta pull up this roster because it's like really strange it's kind of like records was a thing for like three years i think uh they put out the first tiny moving parts full length i mean the first one that you could buy this this couch is full of friendship they had candy hearts they had uh that old gray and tiny moving parts split um Oof. yeah they had direct hits first full length they had that great cynics band they had captain we're sinking so it kind of yeah, says a, big... a lot about this time period where like all these bands could fuck with each other pretty easily yeah like i mean like hostage calm is another band that i i would throw into that bucket like they are like clearly a pop punk band, but could fuck with Twinkle or fuck with hardcore. Like, yeah. But this is this is definitely a year where things are fragmenting, um, and I think by 2014, everything had kind of become its own separate thing again. Yes. Uh, like, and but I think those. Sorry, go ahead. Like hyper compartmentalized too. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe it's starting to swing back the other way again, but definitely in 2012 was the start of people like not knowing that title fight had roots in hardcore Mm -hmm. people just like thinking that title fight were an emo band or, um, people not like not knowing who the casket lottery were on the touche amore split. Yep. Like I de- like I definitely remember that being a thing, and I also like remember that specifically because in 2012, I think that was the year where I like truly felt like comfortable being in the scene. Like I felt like I knew what was happening. Like, like I had I had enough knowledge to be able to talk about things. Okay. Uh, which when you're like getting into a scene, I feel like once you reach that point, that's when you've like made it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Once you start a podcast, you know. I didn't have a podcast in 2012. <laughs> I know. Where I, <laughs> was this like a was was this like a Tumblr thing where you're making friends and stuff? Mm-hmm. Okay. Definitely, definitely. Um, it was either like mid to late 2012 or very early 2013 that I started writing for Stuff You Will Hate too. Oh, so. okay. And Stuff You Will Hate kind of is what we were talking about earlier like the site that covered all of it even though it was it wasn't like a news site it was more like a like making fun of it all (laughs) but you kind of had you kind of had to have like a broad knowledge of the scene because they talked about everything right 
yeah, there is there was something just like intimidating about that writing, which was the intention, right? What do you mean by intimidating? I don't know. It's just like just like really serious opinions that they won't back down from. I feel like stuff you'll hate was kind of the opposite. I think the thing that got you made fun of more than anything on that website is if you had very serious unsolicited opinions. Okay. They were they were kind of like uh they they were kind of like what Pat Kindlin is now or what Sam Ray is now. They were yeah. just shit starters. Okay. I just read the vibe wrong, I think. I also wouldn't blame you if like that was a vibe you got if you were on the site maybe for like a couple minutes and read through a couple articles because, you know, the humor, the sense of humor was very mean spirited. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's it. Um, so you want to talk about Glacomora's classic Just Married? I do. I do okay. want to talk about this. Record. Okay. What is your favorite song on this record? I mean, you're going to give me shit, but like right now it is Why Am I Not Going Under Walter? <laughs> I'm not going to give you shit for that because it's a great song. I but... Know, but I didn't realize until we started this podcast that it's called Un- Un- Under Walter. I just thought it was just like <laughs> them being cheeky, na- na- naming the song the same thing as Snowing. I think my favorite song in this record is uh, My Black Dog slash Cosmic Being. I it's... think the ending of that song is like ungodly heavy for this genre. Yeah, <laughs> uh, like that like key change where it just goes into that like ugly ass chords. It's great. Yeah, yeah, it, like, gets real dissonant and harsh and, like, distressing, and, you know, that's my shit, mm-hmm. so. So, one of my, one of the things about this record that I think makes it really stand out in the entire genre is, you know, emo comes at us with angst, but I think yeah. no one gives us just the pure anger that Just Married gives us. <laughs> um. Yeah, this is a pissed off record. I think they uh, they have the word fuck in three song titles. Yeah. Or some variation. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, also, the first song is called Die Angry. Right. You're right that a lot of emo bands come at us with angst or like this kind of melancholy. A sense that, I mean, ca- like... With a lot of emo, I feel like they're translating depression into music where there's like kind of like a detachment from your emotions almost. Yeah. Like the ability to be introspective about your emotions, which I I don't think comes when you're like in the thick of it. And Glockamora just comes out of the gate like feeling all of it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Everything is happening. And I think that they sound a lot more desperate because of it. Like they sound a lot more like clawing their way out of your headphones, like into your soul. <laughs> I, like there's so much, I don't know how to put it. Like it's not, it's not just personality, but like, yeah, there's like desperation. There's just like, you feel like this is just like an extremely unwell person. I mean, yes, yes. And not um, in like, a christian hotelier way it's more of like you know when you listen to like power violence band and it's just like you you can tell that you have to be a fucked up person to say those things and name your thing and name your your song titles and play that way that's how i feel about glockamora in some way like you have to be fucked up to write these things you like hit the fucking nail on the head just now because like And I don't think it's just power violence, even though, like, no comment is exactly what you're describing. But, like, like, also, like, Alice in Chains' Dirt or, like, I Hate God. Right. Like, that that same type of when you listen to it and you're like, this person is not fucking okay. Yeah. (laughs) That's the the exact same feeling that you get listening to Glockamora. And not even in, like, the same way that you get when you listen to Snowing, because it's also obvious that John Gollum is going through some shit. Mm-hmm. But where he takes kind of like a a more literate approach, uh, Glockamora is very visceral. Yeah, it's interesting how that comes out in so many different like shapes on this record because like the first song is basically like a party e- emo song. Yeah, it's upbeat, it's catchy, it has it's like the easiest riff to play on a guitar. It's probably the only song in still. Um, there's probably some standard tuning songs on this record. Uh, besides this one but <laughs> but then like the next song irrevocable motherfucker 
so fucking hard to play. It's so technical and it's in a really fucked up tuning and stuff. So it's just like, yeah. it's just like all of these feelings come out in so many different shape and forms. And I think that's another reason why this record gets put on the pedestal the way that it is. Cause it's, it's an amazing listen. Like I'll never get sick of this record for sure. This album also kind of just has like a broad fuck up aesthetic. Yeah. You know, like when you, when you look at the cover, that's not a party that people are actually having fun at, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that that's like partying to avoid ills in your life. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got the guy from uh, the Menzingers in the sweater. Yeah. We've got uh Kaitana person yeah. in the corner. I don't know who's the one who's holding the beer and with, with, with his arms up. Do we know who that is? I have no idea, but I like to think it's Andrew WK. <laughs> he got a nice haircut for the occasion. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, look at the picture and then, like, juxtapose it with the name of the album. Right. There's no wife in this picture to be seen. <laughs> There's no bride. <laughs> yeah, because no one has all the seasons of The Simpsons on DVDs. On DVD. Is, <laughs> is married. <laughs> There, there's four seasons of Family Guy. Honestly. That's upsetting. Yeah. Also, shout out to the None More Black poster. Man Overboard's an opener on that show. Yep. Um, Man Over played a couple hardcore shows. <laughs> like, Ellie found a hardcore cred in Man Overboard. <laughs> Did I ever tell you about uh, when I saw them at Sound and Fury 2010? <laughs> no. Yeah, they played Sound and Fury 2010 with uh, Tiger's Jaw was also there. But so was Ceremony. What What are your favorite songs? What are your favorite moments on Just Married? My favorite moment is the end of Cosmic Being, but a close second is right before the end of the closing track where everything drops out and he just kind of like strangles out, it's me and Janine. And then everything like comes back, and then it just becomes like a weird fade out chaos. <laughs> yeah, I mean the like the we the we you made brownies sample so fucking good. The end of anniversary song is like pretty heart rending. Um, Broken cigarettes, just that entire track. For some reason, when I was when I when this one, I got really into why am I not going under Walter, and I just think like the second half of that song when they do like this really just like i don't even know what kind of guitar effect it is but they do like that like really like catchy like riff it's kind of like a brassy tone i don't know how the fuck to describe it but it's just it it, like (laughs) i I know what you're saying the song is like super driving and just like switches up into that riff and it's just like it's kind of euphoric for me and um anniversary Uh, song is it's just an insane song i mean is this a is this like a breakup record do do you like do you like people see it that way? I don't know if I see it as a as a breakup record as much as a breakdown record. You know, not not in like the chugga chugga wee wee sense, but like in the I'm having a mental breakdown and nothing is okay sense. Yeah, um, exactly. Everything's falling apart. Relationships, friendships, relationships with family. It's a it's just I like think... a moment of chaos, a, a quarter life crisis kind of record. Yeah, this this album is kind of like when everything around you is like falling apart around your ears and you kind of have like a moment of clarity where you're like, oh shit, everything is going to hell. And you kind of like ride out that moment. Like, like have you ever had that moment where like you realize everything is going to shit, but knowing that everything is going to shit like kind of makes you stoked on it? I I mean I haven't really taken that opportunity, but I've definitely like if I surrounded myself with like the right shitheads, it would have been that way. Well, I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, now that I think about it, I think the the song that most encapsulates that feeling is uh, "Eat the Fucking Snow," which, uh, as far as this record goes, is kind of like the epic, you know. Like me and Janine, I think like uh, like a good minute of that of that song is just kind of like bullshit, like fade out bullshit, but eat the fucking snow is like a mover. <laughs> I'm there with you on that one. Um, yeah, 
I think like the first four songs are is just a really like an amazing stretch of like going through this record. Um, yeah. And never, the party song to Rivical mother, 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 Motherfucker, which is like extremely twinkly, and then Hot and Formed is like Miller Speed Up, and then Anniversary Song is just like, I guess the most anthemic kind of thing. It's the most um, anthemic, but I think if you hadn't clued into it, that that's the point in the record where you realize that uh, the lyrics are kind of fucked up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, before we move on, and I forget about it, um, this band has like a weird, not weird, but just like unconventional discography. Like there's a lot of music, and I doubt a lot of people have heard some of it. Um, yeah. They ended up as kind of, and I think we've talked about this, as almost like garagey. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, do you see that at any point in their discography, them like transitioning into it? I think Elliot uh, from Pine Overcoat would probably have like a better answer for you there. Honestly, this is the only Glockamora record that I ever listened to. <laughs> oh, the Summer Vacation Split is phenomenal. Like, both sets of songs are fucking incredible i mean word i remember <laughs> listening to the working bones and not feeling it and then never coming back to it which one <laughs> the working bones okay yeah i mean and then they also started in florida and then yes moved to philly yes that is true there's a there's another band coming up on this list that is pure florida emo so can't wait for that but yeah and then uh some post glock bands would be uh i think zach is currently doing a uh, spirit of the beehive which is um really not experimental band <laughs> it's experimental it's kind of fucked up sounding but it's also really cool at the same time and i never really see it as like build as x glockamora like it took me for like it took me a long time before i realized that it was I think that was definitely a conscious decision. Yeah. Yeah, I guess anything else for Glockamora and Just Married? No, not off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, so I broke this year and the, the list into categories again. Um, the I nail biters, that. Yeah, the nail biters were Glockamora and Just Married, which got 19.5% of the votes. And seventeen point eight of the vote, seventeen point eight percent of the votes went to sports by modern baseball, which is like five votes. How many? Uh, how many votes did we get? Like just in this poll, like almost four fifty. So this record, I think, is one of the most cohesive mission statements of a band that I can recall. Just coming out like with a debut. <laughs> Okay. Did they have like? Did they have material like that came out before this? I am not the world's biggest modern baseball fan, so I'm gonna look to see when like Couples Therapy came out and stuff. Couples Therapy is 2013, I think. Um, uh, 2012. 2012. Oh, yeah, okay. that's where it came out. Uh, and then the Nameless Ranger came out 2011. Well, this is better than the Nameless Ranger, for <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh. I think that Tears Over Beers is like modern baseball in a song. Yeah. Do you disagree? <laughs> no, I'm just trying to think of like, does something on sports sound that wildly different from Holy Ghost? You know, like from like where they started and where they ended. I mean, to me, it does. To me, Holy Ghost is a lot more kind of subdued, whereas sports. Uh, sports is like not aggressive but messy it's energetic yeah yeah like the song the song structures are all over the place they don't really feel like uh like conventional verse chorus verse shit um but they also haven't mastered the art of you know th- like that big bridge that ends the song like they did with you're gonna miss it all um like I said, this is a record that like defines modern baseball, but it's also not the most polished example of their sound. Mm-hmm. Right. There's still some real great tracks on here, though, like uh, At Chloe K, 
redo and redone. Uh, I think Coles is a much better acoustic closer than Pothole. I think Pothole's good though. I like Pothole I hate more. Pothole. That's that's like one of my least favorite songs of theirs. Okay. <laughs> um, I I think well, I I think a big discussion that we need to have is are you a are you a Brendan or are you a Jake? Like, which one do you prefer? See, this is a hard one for me to answer because. I swear to God, it wasn't until, like, very recently that I actually realized that Modern Baseball had more than one singer. That's fucked up. (laughs) Is it fucked up? They sound exactly the same. I'm sorry. No, no. Yeah, they sound exactly the same. Jake is the... Jake is the uh, John K. Samson vocalist. They're both the John K. Samson vocalists. What are you talking about? I think that Brendan has a lot more fire in his gut when he's singing really i think so i i both of these vocalists are wimpy as shit what Uh, are you talking about (laughs) okay well on holy ghost i absolutely prefer the like minute barn burners that uh i think i like i prefer brendan on holy ghost i think they're both pretty evenly matched on you're gonna miss it all which is my favorite Mm -hmm. modern baseball record and if I recall correctly, sports is entire, like almost entirely Brendan. I think so. And that may, that makes sense because, you know, these are like some of, some of the first songs that Brendan ever wrote, according to Soupy from the Wonder Years. You, you can tell. Obviously, some of them are great, but they don't have like uh, a very polished quality to them. Right. It's just this part to the next part to the next part without like much of a without much care paid to like a central structure um was this record an immediate like a fire spread or was this like gradually chorus fm's favorite band i mean it, it was gradual but it picked up more and more momentum to the point that you're gonna miss it all was very highly anticipated that's what i remember like when when you're gonna miss it all was first coming out there was already like a hype train that was sending it off yeah i think this is actually my favorite production on any modern baseball record i think it might be the most consistent (laughs) i mean aside from pothole i think you're gonna miss it all has like the most consistent production Um, but this is just like uh if you're gonna miss it all was recorded like this record was i think i would like that whole album even more than i already do i just i really like like how gritty and raw this production is Mm -hmm. it was recorded at drexel which is like a university studio which yeah a lot of usually produces a lot of good records i mean that's where they met right drexel yep that being said, even listening to the lyrics of this band, it's extremely obvious that this is a privileged white boy band. <laughs> Which I think I th- I think we all know they became like very aware and accountable. Ob- obviously, yeah. I mean, I don't think they were ever that problematic. It's just that like I mean, yeah, of course your biggest problem is that the person who used to be in your profile picture isn't anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, this is all... Here's here's the thing. Is this, like, the first Sad Boy record? Like, Sad Boy needs to be defined, but, like... Uh, in, this, in the modern, like, contemporary Sad Boy sense? Like, Young Lean Bucket Hat Sad Boy? Uh, no, I mean, just, like, I'm so sad. My Look at my Talon of the Hawk tattoo type of... Tattoo. Okay, um... I th- I think I think you might be right. I, if anything, this record like codified that. Yeah. Like, kind it kind of like gave it a face. Right. <laughs> that's that's you're full of great observations today. I should just stop talking. <laughs> I I haven't had coffee for like four hours. It's weird. I'm really. I'm, I am yeah. on. I had a Europe and just finished like another cup of coffee, and I'm about to go grab another. All right. <laughs> Uh, you ready to go on to the category that I listed as big dogs? Yes. Uh, I'm going to go grab the other cup of coffee real quick, though. It'll take okay. three seconds. All right. So the the big dogs are records that, you know, definitely had 
had a way of swaying the outcome, but weren't really uh, like going neck and neck with the with the with the nail biters and with. 13.6% of the votes. Maybe because Ian Cohen was like saying vote for everyone everywhere 2012 and everyone <laughs> everywhere 2012 got 13% of the votes. Uh 2012, I mean this this is their record in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is I mean it's got their their hit, you know, I feel exhausted. Which I mean as far as like real fucking good track ones. Like, you don't get much better than that. You really don't. I think, yeah, I think this record, I mean, Everyone Everywhere, as we discussed, their 2010 record was, like, very cleanly produced. They they kind of knew what they were going for right out of the gate. And I think with this record, it's somewhat of, like, an in-between of, like, the twinkle shit and the post-hardcore shit. Post-hardcore. Does that make okay. sense? Um... I mean, I, mean I, I also hear, like, a like the post-rock stuff in there, too. Yeah, because but... there's a lot, like, crescendos with, like, heavier, just, like, downturns is how I'm yeah. imagining it. I guess I've never looked at it that way, but I can see it. Um, I, I just think it's, like, way just stronger and more interesting and less straightly played than the, than, than the 2010 record. Do you think that this this record is underrated? I think it's perfectly rated. I don't think it's overrated. Yeah, okay. I agree. I think 13.6... I think, like, third place is probably exactly right for it. Like, where it is mm-hmm. in, like, the history of, of this genre as well. There's a certain age of person who's just really fucking into everyone everywhere. and I mean, they weren't a cult classic like Guacamora, and they were not like a commercial revelation like modern baseball yeah. they were just kind of like in between and so it was easy for them to get lost in the shuffle for me i think it's also weird because like i was i was a little bit too old to like have modern baseball mean a lot to me but i was also like right I can tell like everyone everywhere was a little bit too like i don't know if sophisticated is the right word for it for me at that time it it wasn't like angsty enough i guess yeah it's not direct it's elliptical it's like (laughs) they're 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 talking and playing around what they're feeling yeah but i i do love the record now um big dog number two was title fight and floral green i remember when this came out i felt like i was still unpacking shed they they like really struck quickly with the second yeah i guess the second full yeah album. when we did that poll about title fight a while back yeah uh and people were calling floral green like the transition period upon re-listening to floral green i think it is a lot closer to shed than it is to hyperview i don't i don't see it as that much of an in-between record like head in the ceiling fan obviously is like a hint of what's to come but most of this record still sounds a lot like Shed. I do agree with that now. But I think, like, maybe lyrically they're a lot more, like, smart than Shed. I don't know if I'd say smart, just, again, less direct. Yeah, I mean, like, calloused. Uh, I don't, Yo, there's who the like, fuck got shot in your neighborhood? That's the second police car. You know, there's a 10,000 uh, oh, attendee uh, Greta Van Fleet. Fleet show, you know? People are getting bud light spilled on their for... yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah we got Greta Van Fleet makes me Greta Van sleep I saw sleep last night oh how was that it was good I went to 30 minutes of it so I guess it was more of a uh, nap I mean yeah I imagine a sleep set like being kind of like a fish set like it can go from, like it can go from like midnight the previous night into dawn <laughs> Do you want to know why I deserve an Edge uh, Medal of Honor? Why? I saw Sleep on 420 completely sober. But don't you take CBD? <laughs> Has that been determined yet? Has that been de- I mean, determined? I mean, there as is an a, edge there break? is a there's a growing movement of people who consider themselves Weed Edge. Uh, do you like love this record? Is this one of your favorite title fight re- re- records? I mean, it's not shed. I, it's about on par with the last thing you forget. I don't dislike any title fight. 
to me, like saying this is one of my favorite title fight records is almost redundant. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I do really, really like this album. It's got some of, it's got some tracks that like still hit as hard as the tracks from Shed, like Numb but I Still Feel It and Lefty and Secret Society are all hits. You mm-hmm. know, yeah, those are all tracks with a capital T. But For I sure. think I I I think something that who showed me it and told me like yo this is like some of their best songs is uh the spring songs ep yeah those yeah the are, spring songs ep is that is sick those are um, crazy good i think that is the true transition between hardcore title fight and shoegaze title fight mm-hmm. probably yeah um hop along do you think hop along is emo so mm, no I don't. I added this one day into the poll in case someone was like, hop along. That could be an emo record. And like, that kind of shows you about how like this poll was hot out out of the gates, but it still wasn't complete because this got 8.8% of the vote still. Uh, Hop along. I think if you want to call any of their records emo, you can get away with it with this one. I just didn't expect that many people to vote for it. How can do you I, feel about Hopalong? something? Yeah, I'm, I want to I was know. about to say, can I tell you something? I have nothing to say about this band. <laughs> have you, like, given them a shot? Yeah, okay. several shots. I guess I would say Painted Shut is the record that I like the most. That's such a fucked up opinion <laughs> that I keep hearing. Like, I think Get Disowned is by far the best thing that, that, uh, that they've done. And I think Bark Your Head Off Dog is, like, a better album, but it's not my favorite. Um, I have that kind of opinion. Uh, but I am like a ride or die hop along fan, and okay. Zoned. I mean, it's my opinions on hop along are like about as strong as like Lacroix flavors. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I just don't. I don't really go one way or the other on them. I have like literally nothing of value or interest to say about this band. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> I I love the fact that like they are that they they were a DIY band for a long time. Like Francis was playing shitty fucking houses and stuff for like or house shows for like a long time and then Get the Sewn came out and they caught some heat and then Sal Creek found out and then the rest is history. Um Yeah, I'm sorry to tangent again, but uh you remember my buddy Josh, right? Was he the one that was like sitting in on a podcast? Yeah, that one time, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm taking him to his first house show soon. Okay. Well, yeah, the I think Tuesday after next, I'm taking him to see Origami Angel and Stars Hollow in San Antonio. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Do you think he's going to be, like, wigging out? Josh, um, I mean? I mean, yeah, Josh is going to, like, be real weirded out by the whole, like, concept and aesthetic of house shows. Like... I I was talking to him once about like how I prefer there not to be a stage and for the band to just play on the floor and he was like what? <laughs> <laughs> just no concept of like DIY like whatsoever. <laughs> uh the next category is got some votes. This was before they had just no shot at all. And you blew it grow up dude. 7.1%. Um shockingly low. I wouldn't yeah, this was like I thought it would be in the big dogs but this uh this got some votes and this is a record that i realized i didn't have a lot of time with or that i just didn't spend a lot of time with and i forgot how just like kind of straight up and it wasn't generic for for the time but generic twinkle band this sounds like yeah this is about as straightforward twinkle as it gets thing about this band this is the only album of theirs that i like and I almost think that that has less to do with the music itself and more with the fact that it sounds like it was recorded in a tin can. And I love that. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I referenced it, but I thought about it when we were talking about albums sounding shitty, like 20 minutes ago, but yeah, this album sounds like garbage. Yeah. Uh, I've only seen you blew it once and they didn't play anything on this album, which was very disappointing, but I saw them in 2015 opening up for the wonder years and state champs okay i saw them opening for say anything oh okay that was that that tour okay um terry vittori is like my favorite you blew it track 
something I think is cool about this album is that uh, the one of the original members of, of this band um, who a- ended up writing a lot of the material on this album was in a hardcore band on Triple B Records that I forget the name of. <laughs> really? I'll figure it out later and tweet it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Does Florida but... have good hardcore bands? Florida's got fucking sick hardcore bands. Okay. Um, I know. I know. There's just like a lot of bands in Florida, in general. Yeah. I mean, off the top of my head, like uh, a needle under the nail is one of the best like metalcore revival bands. I guess you'd say going right now. Yeah. They're they're fucking hard, and you know, blistered or broken up, but everyone still raves about them uh, to the point where they're like still relevant. Mm-hmm. I see. I I constantly see blistered shirts. I've never heard that band. <laughs> so goddamn good. So goddamn good. Uh, also, really high pitched emotive vocals, which are my shit. Mm-hmm. And then going back to the '90s, like they also had like Culture and Morning Again, uh, who are some of the best like vegan straight edge bands at the time. <laughs> um, but back to you, blew it. I I never had like. I never considered them like a favorite or like I was never really like a fan of them in general. Um, but they were always putting out shit and always like relevant from, yeah, from like 2013, I would say they started cause they did that split with fake problems. Oh, or girl up dude came out in 2012, I guess. But yeah. Yeah. This, this band is canceled, right? Like, I don't I mean they broke up and then someone that was in the band for a minute or so or no well I they, thought they, it they was someone the, who's they, the they were in balance like, for a little bit yeah they were in balance for a little bit but they were like a member of this band okay is that how that went down got it yeah I don't know that that sucks this record's real good uh yeah I, I like this one I, I never listened to anything that they put out after this much. Like, keep doing what you're doing was okay, and then by Abendro, they, like, completely lost me. Same. That's the same trajectory yeah. for me. I did not give a little bit, a little bit of a fuck about that record. I thought it sounded yeah. like Intuit Over It, and I didn't like Intuit Over It right record from that year either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have Dad's American Rad Ass uh, on here, too. I am 3.9% of the vote. That's fucked up. I think people that listen to this podcast are probably on the fuck dads train, but whenever I comment fuck dads, I get like downvoted now. This is the last good dads record, but it's also probably the best dads record. I like Tornado. I don't know if I'll call it my favorite, but I do like Tornado. Uh, Shit Twins? Yeah, Shit Twins. Maybe in my top five emo revival songs ever. That song gets me my feelings no matter what. Your mouth open wide. Uh, that was on a mixtape that I made for my first girlfriend. It's not surprising <laughs> at all. Dad's was that yeah. kind of band. Yeah, we saw them together. Uh, that's the Touche Amore Tiger's Jaw show that, I, that I've talked about on occasion. Oh, yeah, I went to that tour. Uh, they're good. They're good live. I do want to make note that, like, I th- I remember people that were like OG emo fans like you know like Mineral Promise Ring blah 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 they were always down with dads but like they like didn't know about like an emo revival besides like or like beyond dads for some reason I think dads just like they hit the they maybe it's because they were named dads so like emo dads were into them (laughs) but I mean yeah it's dads and empire empire as far as like the revival bands that the old people kind of like really respected Mm -hmm. I think as a consequence of that because dads sounded so much like a band from the 90s i think a lot of the newer kids kind of thought of them as generic i think that was that's where like a lot of the fuck dads came from and then a lot of the other half of fuck dads came from nicole from the world is making up rumors about them but then they're still known to be shitty people is that it i yeah i i guess Um, i remember when elliot was on here they were like they stole a base cab from one of their shows i'm sure i'm I'm sure they've been dick bags at house shows like i'm positive so yeah i don't know uh <laughs> so the next category which we can just blast through is had no shot so bands that got like hardly votes at all bad books too i mean 
I made a note here. He's like, this is just not an R emo type of band at all. Like, I don't think people in R emo really love Manchester or Kevin Devine so much. Yeah, I like Kevin Devine. Not enough to like call myself a Kevin Devine fan. I think I actually hate Manchester Orchestra. I think that's a band that I actually hate. And okay. so Bad Books 2 is the cross section of something I really hate and something I'm just okay with. <laughs> I I remember one of the first couple episodes you said that your roommate wouldn't stop playing Manchester and you were like, "I I think I like this band or something like this." Yeah, I think uh the, the fact that Josh played this the or not bad books but manchester orchestra ad nauseum like really made me hate that band yeah and and also i f- here's the thing i feel like if you uh are the type of person to not still listen to brand new after brand new got canceled maybe check out bad books they might scratch that itch for you but they're they're not my thing yeah <laughs> didn't i've never heard i still haven't heard a full album by this band <laughs> I've, I've heard it. i've heard everything they've ever done thanks josh Brave Little Abacus o- o- Okame. I mean, I put this on here just just for me. I didn't expect it to go anywhere, but perfect set of songs, some good covers. Uh, a Casket Lottery, Real Fear. This is a comeback album. They were yeah. not making music for a long time, and then someone was like, "No sleep. You 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 should put this out." And I feel like it's been like a five dollar clearance record in their web store for seven years at this point probably yeah that's a bummer i feel like like if you fuck with small brown bike or hot water music or what's that other band that uh american steel i think if you fuck with those bands you should fuck with the casket lottery real hard yeah and touche amore i did a split with them where do you think Touche Amore got a good amount of their sound? That's like that is that is basically why they did that, just to like put them on blast because they're like, hey, we're like a popular band that like got our sound from you. Like, let's do a split together, and they were probably so stoked about it. But probably seventy five percent of people listening to that were just like hearing Casket Lottery for the first time. Uh, so this is the second time you've in the in the in the history of this podcast that you've used the phrase "put them on blast." And I think that you're using it wrong. Is is putting on blast like bad? Yes. Okay. So it, if I were like talking about beef coming out, would that be putting on blast? Yes. Okay. So that's strictly beef talk. Yeah. Okay. Like I put I like if I say I put that motherfucker on blast, that means I was like talking shit about them. Okay. Interesting. Publicly. Interesting that you picked up on it. Yeah. <laughs> So they, I mean, I guess it's just they, the second time it bothered me. <laughs> but this is honestly like a great record, and they're totally not a cool band, and I don't think our emo kids give a fuck about them. Yeah, it sucks that they're not cool. They're great. Seriously, if you like hot water music, you will like the Casket Lottery. Mm-hmm. Get on that. I think Run for Cover did like a discography repress for Record Store Day for them, which was interesting. That makes a lot of sense. I feel like in some way or another, a lot of Run for Covers roster is indebted mm-hmm. to Cast. Yeah, this one is shocking to me. Maybe it's just me and what I thought, but the Kembe Broad Shoulders did nothing. Like it hardly garnered anything, and I think this is like better than Dad's and You Blew It, and should have been in that category at least. Can I can I say something? I think I know this, but yeah. I don't like Dikembe. I well, let me clarify. Chicago Bulls is an all-time great EP. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like zero, zero question about it. But their LPs just never did it for me. I like they were never able to like really, really catch my attention. I think this is the one that is the only great one. I think what's the next one? Mid something. Medium ship. That one is like yeah. weird. It's basically like a brand new tribute record. Because they got kind of weird in like the brand new type of sense, uh, but it, this one is like a really, really great. I wouldn't say god tier twinkle, but it is exceedingly good twinkle. High tier twinkle. High tier. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm I'm gonna come back to it because it might be a cast of an Echo in the Light situation, and okay. I ended up really loving Echo in the Light. So, all right, next on the list, Dowsing. Dowsing. Still pretty terrible. Yeah, this was another surprising dud. But I fucking love this record. You you love this record? That's strange. I that that's strange. I figured that would be strange because like you know I don't really go in on the cutesy shit, but 
this record's so good. <laughs> it's so it's so fun. It, yeah. Gengar, Gengar, Gengar is like top tier, like of this era. And like I said earlier, along with modern baseball, it kind of foreshadows like the more emo pop in dead a direction that the scene was going to be taking uh, yeah. in a couple years. Yeah. You know? And they've always been doing it DIY too. Like they've never really suited up in any sort sort of sense. Like the most suited up they've gotten is fucking making a record for Asian man. Uh, yeah. uh, but yeah, like I felt like they were one of the first bands to do this kind of like not technical emo style. So I think it's like interesting that, I don't know, maybe it like died with the people that were really into the scene at 2012. I don't know. People aren't really talking about dowsing, I guess. I don't know. That's a bummer. I feel like, uh, honestly, I didn't think about this until just now, but I don't know if mom jeans would exist without dowsing. I don't know if like mom jeans could have like come out of the emo scene if dowsing hadn't laid that kind of groundwork. But we had modern baseball. I don't know if I'd say that mom jeans are ripping off dousing more than modern baseball, but I think uh, they are doing straight up pop songs in the same way that dousing was doing. Yeah. And in a way that modern baseball was kind of divergent from with sports. For I think sure. they started doing more like straight up pop with you're going to miss it all. True. True. Yeah. This is an interesting one. I mean, this it's, it's either this, I mean, I don't think any other dowsing record would have gotten more votes than that. So yeah strange uh me without you 10 stories this was i mean no here this was one record before me without you was cool once again but they have some good songs on here every me without you record has some good songs it's true but like this was the one where i mean i don't know who was it was kind of looking slim for me for uh for me without you at this point because uh pale horses totally breathed in some some some, yeah, some I, life into this band. I Thank- feel like every single other album by Me Without You, I know someone who that's their favorite Me Without You album. Like I always hear, oh, A to B Life is my favorite, or Catch for Us the Foxes is my favorite, or Pale Horses is my favorite. Even the new one. But I never hear anyone say Ten Stories is their favorite. No. And It's All Crazy, It's All False was like a big turning point in that band because that's like a Neutral Milk Hotel sounding record. It's it, it's yeah. strange. It's it's pretty cool, but uh, you know, releasing ten stories after that one was like kind of like, uh, who's who's like listening to them these days? But then Pale Horses, yeah, just huge huge resurgence. You know what I think the thing is? Ten stories came out and people were like, oh shit, is this another lot of speed record? <laughs> right, like their niche had been filled. <laughs> yeah, like very wordy fucking. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I saw me me without you twice on on this cursive tour, and it's they're like such an incredible live band. Oh, stunning live band! Yeah, yeah. Always watch them live, and you, even if they're opening, and I've I don't know. I've probably seen them like eight or nine times at this point, and I've never like gone Damn. to see me. Yeah, I mean, like, but I've never gone to see them. They've always just been touring with the bands I love. Honestly, except for the last Tiger's Jaw tour, that's about, like, the way that I saw every single Tiger's Jaw show that I've seen. Really? I've only seen Tiger. Yeah. I've, I've only seen them once, and it was that, I, that Touche tour. I've, I've seen them seven times, I think. Um, status Landscape, After the Lights. So the thing that I don't think anyone talks about with this band is that when Screamo was kind of dead, they were still putting out real good records and, like, touring and making money as a screamo band um like the thing about the saddest landscape is i don't think they ever reach the highs of like the best screamo bands but they're always pretty good and this record has some goddamn riffs like this is like the heaviest record on our voting block i don't think i've listened to this record really yeah (laughs) i really like it i would i don't think i love anything by the saddest landscape but i really like a lot of their stuff I always just know them because all their records look the same. Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The saddest landscape in 2012 are what Shingard are today. They're a Screamo entry point. Do, like, people regard them as real Screamo? Yeah. Okay, cool. I know a lot of people, the saddest landscape is their favorite Screamo band. Interesting. And they are accessible? I mean, you just call them, like... 
And yeah, they're accessible. As, they're accessible as fuck, okay. and uh, I think they also have uh, some of the more in, like intelligible vocals yeah. in Screamo too. Were so. they were they doing stuff? I mean, would would this be? They this is not part of the wave, but were 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 they wave adjacent with like Touche and with uh, so, pianos? So the saddest landscape was a thing way before almost any band in the wave except maybe defeater um fuck they put something out in 20 in 2003 they put out a lot of stuff holy fuck if i remember correctly they they have done shows with touche um so they're they're definitely like they were kind of a midpoint between the wave and like real quote-unquote screamo (laughs) this is some fucking sports center shit I don't know. <laughs> this is like so nerdy. Like they were like wave, but they were also real. I don't know. It's such like a nerdy thing to say and dissect. But it, like, I say shit like that all the time. I I, I know. This is the first time you've called me out. <laughs> no, it's 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 great. <laughs> I mean, we've said before that we're the sports center of emo. I'll take that. Yeah. All right. Sweet. I was. N- I think like around the first episode of this podcast, I became a fan of Sweet La Loon. So this was, this was me me liking this band is like a year and a half old. Sick. Um, you know why I, you know why I think you like this band? Because they're Twinkle Scrams. Is is there like any shame in liking this band because they're Twinkle Scrams? I the, yeah, I was thinking about this all day. Every person I know who like shits on Twinkle Scrams. Still fucks with Sweet La Loon. It's like they don't realize. But like this is a this is a Twinkle Scrams band for sure. Um and I think uh Quiet Pull the Strings is normally regarded as their best release, but this is my favorite Sweet La Loon album. Okay. Yeah. I isn't the most popular one the one is that the one after before this? I don't know. Didn't they 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 also like just broke up, right? Yeah, I uh, feel like pure shit just wants we La Loon back. <laughs> um, oh, Quiet Pull of Strings. I think that's the one. I also really like that. That's what Dis- I was saying. I think yeah. that's regarded as their best. Yeah. Uh, Distance Closure is also like really Aero. good. That like EP yeah. thing. I like, Yeah, I like Air a lot. Um, it's more post-rocky, but it's also short, so it's accessible. But yeah, solid band. Uh, obviously never had a chance, so yeah. Is, wait, is this like Euro Scrams? Yeah, they are uh, Italian. Okay, so this takes us to a list of like thirty records, probably. And this is Ellie's. 30? I, it's 30. I don't know. It could be. This is Ellie's Jace list. And not all these are Jace. I think some of these are just, just like records we fucked up and didn't put on. Yeah, <laughs> these are Jace and or Oversights, uh, starting with Basement, yeah. Color Me, and Kindness. I don't know how I missed this, but no one called me yeah. out on it. Yeah. Well, um, Basement are a band that I think is more popular now than they ever were yeah. uh, back in the day. Um, and I think the reason that is is because like Color Me and Kindness kind of created a cult around them after they broke up. Like people, like they broke up, and then people were discovering like Covet and. Uh, being like, oh shit, this band actually had some sick songs. Um, and I think I Wish I Could Stay Here is by far the superior release, but this record has some bangers too. Yep. So. My favorite That's one about all I have to say about that. Birds yeah. and Row had no idea they were a band this long ago. Yeah, Birds you, and Row have been a band since like 2006. You, Me, and the Violence is the record, so tell us about it for 30 seconds. Um, sick record. Uh emo violency uh more hardcore oriented um that's it that's all i have to say about that record if you like orchid uh and wish there was like a modernized version of orchid then uh birds and row in 2012 is what you should listen to sick <laughs> yeah uh still making records they're on death wish now yep yep they just put out a record last year that was pretty good being as an ocean dear god is that what it is there's like it's dear god um i think being as an ocean or christian but that's normally like a like a 
Orthodox Jew thing is censoring God when you write it down. This record's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this like but I remember. I don't know what this is. No, it's like post hardcore. It's okay. It's honestly like a lot closer to the wave than you'd expect. Got it. Uh, and I remember like a lot of kids who fucked with a lot of spew fucking with being as an ocean. Okay. But I thought I thought this it, was like hot topic music. They steadily became uh, part of the hot topic crowd, but they've always kind of sounded like this. Gotcha. <laughs> the chariot, one wing. I love this record when it came out. Yeah, it's the last chariot record before they broke up, um, and it is maybe uh, Josh Scogan's best moment musically. Uh, he's a uh, wait, Josh Scogan. Is that the vocalist? Yeah, okay. uh, who was also the original vocalist for Norma Jean, and now he's in 68. Amanda 68. Yeah. yeah. And when I say this might be his best moment, like musically, that is like including early Norma Jean. So, <laughs> word. <laughs> this record's excellent. Ceremony Zoo. This is an interesting one because I don't like this record that much, but I like it way more than, than The L Shaped Man. Uh, this record is trash, and it's a lot better than The L Shaped Man. <laughs> hysteria that's like fucking car commercial music (laughs) i mean yeah this is definitely the album where they were like oh yeah we're on matador now but they were still playing hardcore shows they're still playing diy venues yeah they just sounded nothing like even ronner park which is already like an early example of 80s core yeah like uh, I think all the bands that are kind of doing like the glue or uh, gag or bib thing, I think they kind of owe a lot to Ronert Park. Now mm-hmm. that I think about, it. Uh, circle takes square decom decom. Why can't I say that word? Decompositions, Decompositions. volume one. I don't know. Is this a comp or is this a full length proper? Uh, this is their comeback full length. Okay. Uh, it's fine. <laughs> it's a lot more. It's post metal, honestly. It's a lot more metal influenced than uh, as the roots undo, which is already pretty metal influenced as far as screamo goes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's fine. Do you think anyone uh, would have voted for this? No. Right. <laughs> I'm. If we were doing 2004, and we had as the roots undo on. I think it might have like come in yeah. in like third place. Right. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Uh this was Code Orange Kids with Love is Love Return to Dust. This was like a think piece album. I remember that vividly. Yeah. yeah. A V Club wrote them up. <laughs> they were like Code Orange Kids is the future of hardcore. Yeah. Um this record is also emo adjacent because Adam from Tiger's Jaw is on it. What is he on on he it? He does uh he does guest vocals on hang on let me pull up the record i because i don't know the name of the song off the top of my head but if i mm-hmm. see it i'll know it, you know did this album get a lot of press because like kurt baloo produced it and stuff and this was like around i mean whenever converge puts out a record it's like a huge year and people talk about it but uh converge Wait no, did they? They they did not put out. Yeah, they they did put all we love we leave behind like a few yeah. months before that. Like, do you think that helped it? Um, I think it did. Uh, but also like Kurt Ballou, like when you <laughs> like hit, anything he produces is automatically like beloved. You know, like it already kind of has a uh, like a built-in fan base. Uh, Adam is on Colors into Nothing. Uh, also, Mike from the Red Court is apparently on this record. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, this was a huge record. I remember just like a lot of music journalism like dogpiling on this record. And it's weird because the next thing they did, I mean, they like quickly kind of turned out and turned out of this. They went from being like weird core into like being one of the the first bands to be like hey this disembodied band was sick yeah yeah <laughs> so is, do you think there's any other emo adjace i feel like emo kids are all just kind of down with code orange these days yeah yeah um i remember i remember these days of the band pretty vividly mm-hmm. um and emo kids have always fucked with code orange yeah 
Every time I die, X Lives is the next one. No, Converge. Oh, oh we converge. love Sleep yeah. Behind. Yeah, there it is. I mean, real quick, my 30 second take. Uh, converge is one of my favorite bands of all time. Uh, in my opinion, they've never made a record that's straight up bad, but uh, this is like a lower tier record, maybe like six, number six out of 10. Uh, it does have one of my favorite Converge songs, though, Sadness Comes Home. I think that song is a fucking kicker. I remember when this came out, it was like best new music. Everyone loved it. it yeah, like... it's... Uh, I mean, it continues the the kind of like prog poisoning in the guitar work that Kurt Ballou had been afflicted with. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's a savage way to put it. Yeah, I don't know. Whatever. I think prog rock is going to always be less interesting than breakdowns. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but not much, but nothing really to do with emo in any way. Yeah. Uh, X Lives, Every Time I Die. This was a big one. E- everyone fucks with this record. Yeah. Um, and everyone fucks with Every Time I Die. Uh, this is another band that has never made a bad album. Or a bad album. No. Yeah. So I was thinking, what's the one after this? Uh, uh, from Parts Unknown. Yeah, that was that's one that, that album's ha- great. Yeah, and it has like Panic at the Disco, uh, Brian Fallon's on it. Oh yeah, that's that one. Uh, no, Brendan Urie is on the new one, or the most recent one. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, that that one has the Coalesce guy on it. Yeah, and, and Brian Fallon. I think when I was very first getting into hardcore, they were kind of shit on as like a scene band. Um, but now they've been around long enough that people are like, yeah, every time I die is hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they've, they've put in the work. They've been touring yeah. their asses off forever. Uh, Joa did We're Better Than All This, or We're All Better Than This. Uh, that was an oversight. That's an emo record as fuck. Yeah. I only threw this in because it was an oversight. Uh, I have zero opinion on this album. <laughs> um, I think I have this one. Yeah, I think I You like you own it? Yeah, I think I own this one. Sick. But Does not... that mean that you like it? No, I I, I like the North End more. <laughs> okay. Um, uh Loma Prieta. Is that five? Is that what that Roman new, new four. New, four? Okay. Four. <laughs> Just V is five. Um <laughs> Thanks for the math lesson. <laughs> uh the, a lot of people think this is the best Loma Prieta record. I do not, but it is a very good record. Um, and it kind of shows Loma Prieta uh, in that space where they're trying to break out of uh, Screamo. Like, not necessarily that they don't want to be a Screamo band anymore, but they're that they're tired of being constricted by the Screamo genre. Okay. I I don't know much, like, much history on this band besides like hardcore kids love them scram's kid love scram's kids love them uh but i don't know like what like the overarching opinion is like i mean they've been a band for a while um they were kind of part of the whole dangerous punch click um and they uh are very 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 good um I think Normies like this album the best and Uptight Screamo Elitist uh, prefer Dark Mountain. Okay. Um, and my favorite is Lifeless. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've I've always considered them as one of like those serious fans that like they're just like serious core, like very serious. And No, serious core is more like uh, the ghost inside. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> You know, like uh, hardcore, uh, but like polished, but also very like or serious. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> uh, this band, I don't think, takes itself very seriously at all. Okay, I mean, I just just like especially buy, on just like buy like their album layouts and shit. Well, if you uh, if you like listen to their older shit, I think they have like a a bad case of the goofy song titles. Oh fuck! Yeah. Um, let me chat. Let me let me read some of my favorites here. Hang on. It all went down like an episode of Law and Order. Oh God. Uh, <laughs> uh, Screamo Triathlon, and my personal favorite. I have a fear of young Asian boys. Oh my God. 
Yeah. All right. I'm going to hold you accountable to 30 seconds on on most of these going forward. Uh, we're going out of order eventually within uh, alphabetical here. Uh, State Faults, Desolate Peaks. Is this the band that eventually turned into Oso Oso, or am I thinking of State Lines? That's State Lines. State okay. Faults is I, I fi- they were I figured like because this band is Scream Up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but also kind of. I always of, get that kind of big because they were like a no sleep band they were like they were kind of like legit yeah i don't know why i get these bands mixed up because state faults is like honestly better mm-hmm. <laughs> but um pretty good pretty good uh scream out record check it out if you haven't heard it that's it <laughs> uh this next one tawny peak self-titled i love this record i had no idea yeah. when this came out at, at all I, I, I had no idea I mean, yeah, that's fine. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> you don't have any opinion on it? Nope. This is this is one of the weird years where I don't have much to say about a lot of the records. Okay. This is like extreme. Yeah. T- that that uh, that Tawny Peaks LP is like extremely underrated, and I think kids would love it if they listened to it. And when I say kids, I mean like you know the R emo kids for sure. Yeah. I mean, I'll give it another shot. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Touche casket lottery split. Makes sense. That I it think came we kind of talked about this earlier. What? But like, what Touche songs are on this? Um, weren't because weren't weren't they doing covers on their splits? Like, didn't they do a replacements cover? Yeah, they covered Unsatisfied, which is uh, my favorite replacement song. Yeah. Um. Then Casket Lottery has White Lies and Myth. Solid split. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Uh, Trash Talk One Nineteen. Uh, this was that. This was that year. Yeah. This is the year that Trash Talk broke. Thanks to, like, Odd um, Future and all that stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, and this was also the year where Trash Talk seemed to, like, make a big break from the hardcore scene. Like, they just kind of became their own thing. And I started seeing people who had no relationship with any DIY music whatsoever wearing, like, the the Trash Talk logo shirt. That was a really wild and exciting thing to see. Um the the like hip hop and hardcore crossover that people just wanted to go in a mosh pit basically and yeah it kind of presaged what's going on right now yep I think yep yeah. but I mean the burning question is was trash talk ever good I really like trash talk <laughs> okay <laughs> I I I like them a whole lot um it's just like it's just like absolutely. big energy music really. It's not like I think they're amazing songwriters or anything, but I have been to enough trash talk shows in in my life to know that they put on a hell of a fucking show. Yeah, and that's all that matters to a lot of it. And they they capture the chaos pretty well on record. Yeah. Um, verse bitter clarity, uncommon grace. Uh, didn't like Patrick from Axe Grind like say that he hates his band or something? Yeah, I don't really like them either. Uh, they is- are. This is hardcore, right? Or is this yeah, press hardcore? Like, I mean, they're like uh, in that modern life is war vein. Okay. Uh, yeah, like epic melodic hardcore. They're meh. I mean, I know a lot of people were like, they they got out of hardcore. They became ex hardcore kids, but they still fucked with verse. But that was never, that was never my shit. I think verse is like hardcore for people who. Uh, Hang on, let me let me try and think of a better joke than the one I said because I was gonna say hardcore for people who won't be straight edge next year, but that was already like a mongoloid shirt about verse. Christ, <laughs> that's that's awesome. For anyone who doesn't know, the mongoloids made a shirt uh, about this band called Verse Won't Be Straight Edge Next Year, and then Verse was not straight edge the year after that. Really, that's yeah, that's insane. They broke edge, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it's it's hardcore for people who were never angry enough to really be into hardcore. Like, this is not music for, like, the same kind of fuck-ups who dig, like, you know, lyrics like Glockamora. Or, like, you never, you never catch someone who's into, like, neglect also banging verse. It's too, uh, too normie. Okay. <laughs> 
I always got so, them mixed up with well-adjusted people. There you go. <laughs> I always got them mixed up with uh, Xerxes from Louisville. Xerxes is better. Yeah, I just for some reason they all they like got mixed up in my mind for some reason. I don't know. That yeah, that whole thing kind of started blending together. Yeah. Uh, VOD, the cursed remain. The Cursed Remain Cursed? Is that Vision of Disorder? Is that what VOD is? Vision of Disorder. Yeah, that was their comeback record. Oh. Was it good? Yeah, uh, yeah it was pretty good. Uh, it kind of was a fusion of everything they did throughout their career into one. Pretty good record. Cool. Uh, we Were Skeletons, Blame and Aging. This is a band that I always associate with the, with the last the Sass Landscape because I've never heard them, but they've put out a lot of records on a lot of... Uh, and, and they were on Top Shelf. Yeah, um, this is uh, one of those bands where I think, like, if you were into Screamo in 2012, you knew of We Were Skeletons, for sure. Yeah. Um, but no one ever talks about them anymore, and I think the reason that is is because they were never that great. Do you want to know something funny? I own what? this record. I bought it at, at, a, at a record store for $2 because it was on top shelf. That makes sense. I haven't listened to it, though. I don't think you're missing much. So tell me about Zabalba and the record Hasta la Muerte. One of the hardest albums of all time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know that uh, I know that you love this band and a lot of people adore this band. Uh wait, how do you know that I love this band? Have I just talked about them like at length before? Maybe that wasn't you that said that like they're the 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 split with incendiary that split with incendiary is like one of your favorites of all time. Was that you? Oh no. That's not me. Okay. Yeah, but I do really adore this band. Uh, the opening track on this album, No Serenity, is uh, like one of my all-time favorite hardcore songs. I grabbed the mic uh, when I saw them play last. Uh, they closed their set with it, and it was like a transcendent moment. <laughs> Damn. Uh, they also have an extended version of their classic track, Cold, as the closer. Um, and I don't think it's as good as the original Cold, but it's up there. Word. Yeah. Um, is there like a record by them that's like their best? Maybe this one. Okay. Uh, Tierra y Libertad is also pretty good. They're a Southern Lord band. They must be yeah. heavy. They must be heavy. They're uh, like a Southern Lord band, but also like they have punk and hardcore roots for sure. Yeah. Uh, I've never heard of this band. We came out like Tigers, Agelessness, and Lack. This is uh, Screamo mixed with black metal. Okay. Uh, very good stuff. Uh, I only like black metal in the context of Screamo. So. Do I see a um, violin player? A vi- yes. A, yes, you do. A violinist. It works. Does this have anything to do with like black gays that made up genre for uh, Death Heaven fans? I mean, yeah, Death Heaven is... Uh, I'm not going to say ripping off this band because I don't think they've ever heard of We Came Out Like Tigers, but... They're basically doing the We Came Out Like Tigers sound with uh, more straight up metal. Got it. Singles like or singles going confetti by Give. Yeah. Uh, Give are one of those bands that along with like Praise were kind of doing that revival of the Revolution Summer type sound. Yeah. So in that way, I guess they're more emo than anyone else on this list. But, sure. Uh, this is a compilation of uh all the singles that they'd released to this point and it's very good i like give a lot is give still making music uh yes yes they are but they just like have not put anything out recently right i recently picked up a cheap copy of electric flower circus that that record's sick yeah (laughs) osteo mort uh Uh, this is this is a screamo band that a lot of people like i don't think i've ever actually listened to them (laughs) Yeah. You're just like protecting yourself by putting it on here. Yes. <laughs> All right. And then I mean, I... <laughs> uh, the record. I'm gonna let you pronounce that. Uh, Nagi Kanisa. I have no idea. <laughs> the, yeah, this is this. It's just a French screamo band. Like, if you like French screamo, then you know what to expect. <laughs> All right. And then the final one on this entire year mindset leave no doubt uh youth crew revival it's good but you know it's their fault that there's youth crew revival happening again so that's the band for that, that i okay 
Yeah, for that, uh, I must go back and kill them in the womb. Well, them and stick together. I think they're equally guilty. Oh, yeah. This is on React. React Records. Is, yes. Is doing yes. that thing. All right. That is extremely 2012. That is everything. Yep. We went way off. We, 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 went, we went way off the path. Um, yeah. As, I think it's so funny to look at 2012 and just notice how fucking messy of a year that it was. Yeah, I think this is one of my least favorite years that that we've that we're doing. Yep, Go, I'm going up with 2013 tomorrow. I have to put that list. I'm gonna send it to you probably in the morning. Uh, All right. Yeah, that's gonna be that that year was such an explosion. It's gonna be insane. All right. Well, with that, I think. That's the that's the end of this episode. Okay. This episode was almost as messy as this year. <laughs>